Brother Ibrahim Al Arid. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ قال الله يا عيسى بن مريم أأنت قلت للناس أأنت قلت للناس اتخذوني وأمي إلهين من دون الله قال سبحانك ما يكون لي أن أقول ما ليس لي بحق إن كنت قلته فقد علمته تعلم ما في نفسي ولا أعلم ما في نفسك إنك أنت علام الغيوب ما قلت لهم إلا ما أمرتني به أن أعبد الله أن أعبد الله ربي وربكم وكنت عليهم شهيدا ما دمت فيهم فلما توفيتني كنت أنت الرقيب عليهم وأنت على كل شيء شهيد إن تعذبهم فإنهم عبادك وإن تغفر لهم فإنك أنت العزيز الحكيم قال الله هذا يوم ينفع الصادقين صدقهم لهم جنات تجري من تحتها الأنهار تجري من تحتها الأنهار خالدين فيها أبدا رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه ذلك الفوز العظيم لله ملك السماوات والأرض وما فيهن وهو على كل شيء قدير صدق الله العظيم بهال God will say, O oh Jesus, son of Mary, did this you say to mankind, worship me and my mother as gods in derogation of God? Jesus would say, glory to thee. Never could I say what I had no right to say. Had I said such a thing, you would indeed have known it. Because you know what is in my heart. 
but I know not what in thine, and you know all that is hidden. Never said I to them any ought except that what you did command me to say. And I was a witness, and I was a witness among them, and when you did pick me up, you were the watcher over them. Because you, you are a witness to all things. If you punish them, they are your servants. If you forgive them, then you are the almighty and wise. God says, this is a day in which truthful will profit from truth. To them will be gardens underneath which rivers are flowing, their eternal homes. Allah, or God, is well pleased with them, and they are with him. And that is the great salvation. Ladies and gentlemen, again, we welcome you on this very special night. As most of you know who is Pat Robinson, and many of you also know about Billy Graham. All of them are great people who devoted their lives for learning. Another person is Jimmy Swagger. He is indeed a great human being. And most of the humans owe a lot to such people because they devote their lives to learning. Jimmy Swagger invited our speaker tonight for a debate three days ago. And the debate was taped and will be available. If anybody interested, he may contact the MSA branch in the Islamic Center of Tucson. Or he could ask any of the gentlemen uh, over there, and he will be provided with whatever information he would like. Mr. Didat is a well-known scholar, a man of international repute. He is indeed a dominant figure in his field. It is really a rare chance to have such a man to speak to us here and let us benefit of his knowledge. Mr. Didet will be lecturing here for approximately about an hour, and then after the lectures, there will be a session for questions and answers. I would request everybody to remain seated and calm, if possible, to let the others get the benefit of his knowledge. For the questions and answers, period, the questions, we will give priority for the verbal questions. That is to say, if you have a question, there are two mics, one of the left hand side, right in front of you, and the other one on the right hand side, right in front of you there. So you kindly step forward and stand in front of the mic and make a cue there. If you have more than one question, then ask one question and then go to the back of the queue 
And then when the chance comes, ask the other question. But please, don't give us another lecture here. We are here to listen to one lecture. And if you would like to give us another lecture, then arrange for it and invite us, and we would be delighted to be here and hear your lecture. But please do ask one question and limit the question to one minute or less if possible. Now, ladies and gentlemen, without wasting most of your time, I will let our uh, brother Ahmed Didat speak for you. Alhamdulillahi wahda. Wa salatu wa salamu ala man la nabiyya ba'da. Allahumma ya mufatihul abwaab, wa ya musabibul asbab, wa ya dalil al-ha'irin, tawakkaltu alayka ya rabbul alameen, wa ufawidu amri lallah, inna allaha basirun bil ibad. Mr. Chairman and brethren, it gives me great pleasure to share with you some knowledge on the subject of two pictures of Jesus. Two pictures of Jesus, Quranic and biblical. To my non-Muslim brothers, this might seem strange that I'm saying that there are two pictures. There is a picture of Jesus Christ in the Quran and the Christians have a picture of Jesus Christ in the Bible. And I am going to try in the short space of time that is given to me to do justice to that subject, Quranic and Biblical. In the Holy Quran, in chapter 3, verse 42, we are told about the enunciation and the status of Jesus Christ. It begins, chapter 3, verse 42, it begins, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, in the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. It says, Behold, the angel said, O Mary, Inna Allah astafaki wa taharaki wa astafaki ala nisail alameen. That God Almighty has chosen thee and purified thee, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Ya Maryam uknuti li rabbiki wasjudi warke im ar So, O Mary, worship thy Lord devoutly. Prostrate thyself and bow down in prayer with those who bow down. That this is part of the tidings of the things unseen which we reveal unto thee, O Apostle, by inspiration. It says, You were not with them, O Muhammad, when they cast lots with arrows as to which of them should be charged with the care of Mary, nor was thou with them when they disputed the point. The background to these verses is this that the mother of Mary, she had vowed that if God Almighty gave her a child, she would dedicate that child for temple services, feeling and believing that God Almighty will grant her a son, yearning for a son, a male issue. God heard her prayer, and a child was born. And it happened to be a female. And a female is very much unlike a male for temple services. She was disappointed, naturally. But according to her vow, as soon as the child grew up to be big enough to look after herself, she takes this child to the temple, the temple of Jerusalem, offering this child services to the people who were serving God. And when these people saw this child, this beautiful child, everybody was clamoring to be the godfather of this child. You know, it's a Western connotation. Godfather means somebody who will look after the child as a guardian. 
people were clamoring, the priests were clamoring. So they said, now, the way to solve this problem is everybody wants to own the child, Mary. So they started casting lots, like head or tail. You know, we do head or tail, you toss the coin. So they casted lots according to the practice of the time, and it came to the turn of Zechariah that he was the fortunate person to be the godfather to this child. And there was a dispute, as always in things of this nature. You know, when you throw the dice, and if the dice falls for six, he said, no, no, you cheated. You know, says, you know, we do that. This is human nature. And there was a dispute about the throwing of the dice. So God Almighty reminds Muhammad, and in other ways he's informing us, that how do you know all these things of Muhammad? How did this knowledge come to you? You were not there when they cast lots with arrows, nor were you there when they disputed the point. Where did this knowledge come to you from? So God Almighty assures him and is assuring us that this is from himself. This knowledge is given to him by God. But our Christian brethren, they would say, no, this is not from God. This is Muhammad's own creation. This is his own concoction, the Quran. See, because they do not believe in this revelation. They say that the Bible is the last and final revelation of God, though it doesn't say so. The Muslim claims that the Quran is the last will and testament of God. There is a dispute, and we try to settle that dispute, you know, with regards to the Bible. This Monday just gone by, Monday the 3rd, in Baton Rouge, a debate took place between myself and uh, Brother Jimmy Swaggart, one of the most prominent evangelists in the Western world today. He appears on more than 700 TV commercial stations, and as he says himself in his own book, he says thousands of cable channels. He's the most prominent in Christendom today. An amazing personality, charming people, him and his wife. I met them both, and I love them dearly. We had this debate, and I understand, I was given to understand, it will be also aired through your, some of your TV channels in your city very soon through the Jimmy Swaggart ministry. But now, coming to the point about this picture of Jesus in the Quran, God says that this is from me to you. The Christian says, no, this is Muhammad's creation. So let us analyze what I have just read to you. You see, at the very first verse that I read to you, God Almighty is telling us, told through Muhammad, telling us that Mary was a woman chosen by God Almighty about the women of all nations. This is enshrined in the Quran. Mary, the mother of Jesus, a woman about the women of all nations. So the question arises, why would Muhammad say such a thing? That he is honoring the mother of his opposition, if there is such a thing. There isn't. Muhammad belongs to the same brotherhood of the prophets of God. Moses, David, Solomon, Jesus, Muhammad. It's a brotherhood of prophethood. But from the Christian point of view, Muhammad is an opposition. He's a challenger to the integrity and position of Jesus. But now this person is telling the world, Muslims as well as non-Muslims, that Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was chosen above the women of all nations. And this he's telling in the first instance to his own people. Because Muhammad, he will admit, was an Arab. He was not an Indian. I'm an Indian of Indian extraction. I come from South Africa. We have some Sudanese brethren from Africa. We have some Malay brethren from Indonesia, Malaysia. He wasn't speaking to them. He was speaking to his own people, the Arabs. And he was telling them that not a, an Arab woman, not his own mother or his wife or his daughter which chose, was chosen above the women of all nations, but Mary, the mother of Jesus, a mother of his opposition. I'm asking people, the missionaries, 
Please account for that. Why would an Arab go out of his way to provoke other Arabs, telling them that a Jewess, a woman from a nation that has been looking down upon them for 3,000 years, a nation that was looking down upon the Arabs for 3,000 years, they keep on repeating that Father Abraham had two wives, Sarah and Hajra. They say Sarah and Hagar. And they say that Sarah was his legitimate wife. But Hajra was a bond woman, a slave woman. And her children, they disparagingly describe as the Hagarines, the children of Hagar. Hagarines is a new term they have invented, the missionaries. And in their books they say, now Islam is not Islam, which means a religion of peace, but it, they say it's Hagarism. You know, a religion of, from the children of Hagar, Hagarism. This is how they call us. Arabs are Hagarines, and the religion of Islam is Hagarism. They have been looking down upon the Arabs as the children of that bond woman, that slave woman. And even today, the Jews look down upon the Arab peasants. They still look down. 3,000 years they have been looking down upon these people. And yet, this mighty messenger of God, he honors this Jewess and says, please account for that. Why would an Arab go out of his way? He's going out of his way to provoke his own people and honor a Jewess. Explain that. Unless he was commanded from a higher source. Because on the human level, from the human point of view, to me, there is no woman better than my mother, or my wife, or my daughter. Why yours, my opponent, my opposition? Why? And it continues, verse 45. Why is qalatil malaikatu ya Maryamu? So behold, the angel said, O Mary, inna Allah yubashiruki bi kalimatim minhu, that God Almighty gives you glad tidings of a word from Him. A word from him. And the Christians say that Jesus is the word of God. The Muslim says, yes, Jesus is the word of God. This Muhul Masih, his name will be the Messiah, translated Christ. This Muhul Masih, or Isa ibn Maryama, Jesus the son of Mary, wajihan fi dunya wal akhirah, held in honor in this world and in the hereafter. وَمِنَ الْمُقَرَّبِينَ And of the company of those nearest to God. As the Christians would say, sitting on the right hand of God. Now we Muslims would agree with that, but qualified by saying that right hand of God does not mean physically, does not mean geographically, because it's God is spirit. The Bible says, God is spirit, and those that worship Him must worship Him in truth and in spirit. Not in form, shape, or size. A spiritual being who permeates the whole universe. The things that we can imagine and situations we can't imagine. He permeates everything, everywhere. Where is his right hand? He says, no, it means in status, in stature. He is closest to God. You see, in Eastern terminology, a person of my right hand is the person from whom I take my advice. Like my, my president, my chairman or my Prime Minister, see? on my right hand. He might be sitting on my left hand, he might be sitting behind me, but he's on my right hand, meaning a place of importance. This is the status of Jesus, in the company of those nearest to God. And he will speak to the people, Mahdi wa in childhood and in maturity, and he shall be of the company of the righteous. When this good news was given to Mary, the mother of Jesus, she naturally responds. She was not married at the time. I don't know whether she was married afterwards. In Islamic tradition, we know nothing about her and Joseph the carpenter. We know nothing about that relationship. But we know, as we are told, that she was not married at the time. So she naturally responds. She said, She said, Oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? Physically, sexually. 
in response to that, the angel replies, Qala said, Even so, Allah creates what He wills. So whenever he decrees a matter, he merely says, with be and it is. For God to create a Jesus without a human father, just like that. For him to create a million Jesuses without father, without mother, just like that. But if he creates a million Jesuses without father and mother, who's going to nurse them? But he can, by his act of will, he can create million Jesuses without father, without mother. Millions of Adams without father, without mother. And the Muslims believe that so Jesus was created. He was created by the act and will of God. And this word, this word of God, the Muslims say it's not God. The word of God is not God. The Christian agrees with us up to a point. He believes with us. He shares with us this thought that everything God created was by his word. In the book of Corinthians we are told, by faith we know that the heavens and the earth were created by the word of God and that the things visible came through the force invisible. In other words, the invisible force and will and plan of God brought everything to be. So the Christian agrees that that is so. God created, like in the beginning, the book of Genesis, chapter 1, it is said that God said, let us make man. He also said, let there be light, and there was light. He said, now we say this word, we take no exception to it, that is said, but not literally, not literally. In others, he will. Is this our human language? We say he said, but he didn't say it with a mouth like mine. He didn't utter the words, sun, and the sun came into being, moon, and the moon came into being, galaxies, and man, and animals, and plants, you know, millions and millions of things, he's uttering the words, what he wants. No, God doesn't do that. He wills it and the thing comes into being. But according to our human limitation, we say he said, everything is his word. So we say the word of God is not God. It is his word. As my words are not me, they are mine. I say book, it's my word, but I'm not a book. I say pen, it's my word, but I'm not a pen. See, the, your words and you are two different things. The God and his word are separate things. They are his, but they are not him. The Christian agrees, through and through, except he makes an exception now. He said, no, in the case of Jesus, the word of God is God. I said, that is a Hindu idea. This is actually Hindu philosophy, the philosophy of my ancestors. They were Hindus. They believe that the word of God is God. Therefore, they do not hesitate in worshipping God Almighty in the form of a man or a woman or a monkey or an elephant. All these things, they are consistent. They say, look, the word of God is God. Do we not see God in the cow? You say, well, God is there. He's not absent from anywhere. So he said, we worship him in that form. Is he not in the elephant? So, well, he's everywhere. He permeates everything. So I said, well, we worship him in that form. And on and on. You see, that's Hindu. He philosophizes. His logic is very good. But now that is Hindu philosophy, that the word of God is God. The Christian agrees, except that exception. So, no, in the case of Jesus, his word is him. We say, no, his word is not him. See, it is his, but it is not he. Now, this idea that God created Jesus by his act of will, his word, is unanimously accepted in Islam. You see, Islam happens to be the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith for its followers to believe in Jesus. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. What we are made to believe is that Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We are made to believe and we accept that he was the Messiah, the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe in his miraculous birth, that he was born without any male intervention. 
And we believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. We are going together. The only parting of the ways between the Muslim and the Christian is the divinity of Christ. That Jesus is God. We say, we are made to say that Jesus is not God. They say that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. We say that God does not beget. This is the dividing line. If we can understand each other's respective points of views, I know that my Christian brethren are sincere. They are sincere in the love and feeling for Jesus or in reverence for Jesus, they place him on the state of divinity, that he is God Almighty, who's come down to earth as a man. He is God incarnate. We say that again is a Hindu idea. This is a Hindu idea, an Aryan, a Hindu idea. It's not Semitic. Semitic meaning that in the religion of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, these are Semites. You know, Father Abraham, his children, they are Semitic people. Among the Semites, this idea of God becoming a man is unknown among the Semites. This is an Aryan idea. My ancestors, they believed that Rama was the seventh incarnation of God, Rama. Krishna was the eighth incarnation of God. Buddha was the ninth incarnation of God. And they believe in endless incarnations, that God Almighty keeps on coming into the world again and again as a man as the need arises. It's the same God, one God, but that God in history, he comes into the world in different forms. Endless incarnations. Because they reason, my cousins, my ancestors, they reason. And their logic was very good about this idea of incarnation, God becoming a man. They said, you see, God Almighty, he's so pure, he's so holy, he's absolute holiness, like a holy robo. Now, what does this holy robo know? know? How I feel when I see a beautiful young thing. What does he know? I'm 69. You know, to you, father, grandfather, uncle, yes. But what does he know how I feel? Even now, at the age of 69, when I see a shapely thing, what does he know how I feel? What right has he to tell me that thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife? What does he know what is to covet? So to be qualified, he must come down to earth. He's born like any other human child, and as he's growing, in the absence of his father, somebody's trying to make love to his mother. He's too small to do anything about it, but he knows how he feels. As he's growing, somebody's trying to make love to his sister. He knows how he feels. He's married, now somebody wants to take his wife out. He knows how he feels, so he's qualified to tell you, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. He's qualified. That is the Hindu philosophy, the logic of God becoming a man. It is like some cynic said about his holiness, the Pope, when he made his pronouncement on the pill about birth control. He's telling people, you can't take the pill, but you know, you must find out fertile period, infertile period. You know, when you come together with your wife, you must know fertile, infertile period. So somebody remarked, he said, the guy who doesn't play the game, what right has he to lay down the rules? Does the Pope play the games we play? Does he? No. Then what right has he to tell us when and when? So similarly, my Hindu cousins reason that God Almighty also, he must become a man to understand the problem of man. Logical. Very logical. The Christian says, look, before Jesus, God did not incarnate. After Jesus, he will not incarnate. He is the only incarnation. Means the only time that God came into the world as a man, he came, came in the form of Jesus Christ. The Muslim, he says, that God does not incarnate at all. He doesn't have to become a man to understand the problem of man. The creator knows what he has created. If I made this table, I know what the table is. I don't have to become a table to understand the table. If I made this microphone, I know what I've made. I'm qualified to tell you how to use it. If I made the false Wachen beetle, I don't have to become a false Wachen beetle to understand, to tell you about the false Wachen beetle. If I made it, I know what it is, and I can tell you how to use that machine of mine that I made. 
Similarly, we say, God Almighty, he made things, he knows his creation, and he's qualified to tell you how to and how not to, how not to abuse this machine of his. He's qualified. So God does not incarnate. He doesn't become a man to understand the problem of a man. The maker knows what he has made. What he does is he chooses a man from among men, one of us, flesh and blood in all respects. But that person is so finely attuned. He's so sincere to God that God Almighty communicates with him on a higher spiritual level, what we call revelation. It's like the electromagnetic waves of the spiritual world. This person, our brother, he receives them. He hears them. We are sitting by his side, but we don't. We are too coarse to apprehend those messages. He hears them on a higher level, and he conveys them to us on our human level, 600 miles an hour, sound way. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, and on and on. He's telling us on our human level. We say such a person is a prophet of God, is a mouthpiece of God. He's speaking the words of God, but he's not God. Anyone, none of them, every prophet of God we love, respect, and revere, reverence, but we say they are speaking God's words, but they are not God's. This is the Muslim stand. He doesn't say to the Hindu, he says, look, Rama is not God, Krishna is God, but Muhammad is God. He doesn't tell the Christian, he says, look, Jesus is not God, but Muhammad is God. No, he says nothing of the kind. He said, they are all his creatures, we must love them, respect them, revere them, follow them, but worship none but God, the Father in heaven, who is the real God. So Messiah, Messiah, Jesus is the Messiah, he is the Messiah, translated Christ. Now, this expression, Christ, does that make him into a God? The Christians think so. That this word, Christ, this, he is the Christ. He, they're thinking that this is some type of a term to describe God in human form. No. What is Christ? Coming from the word Hebrew word, Messiah, Arabic, Masih, coming from the root word, Masaha in Arabic and Hebrew. Masaha means to rub, to massage, to anoint. Priests and kings were anointed in consecration to their officers. See, it's like the coronation ceremony or like your graduation ceremony. Priests and kings in the good old days, they used to be anointed with holy oil or with water. So from today, you are our imam, you are our priest. Or from today, you are our ruler, you are our king, sovereign. Priests and kings, this thing was done to them. So we have the word messiah means anointed, means appointed. That's what it means, appointed by God. So Jesus was a person appointed, anointed by God. Irrespectful, respectful position. And this is not a unique term in the Bible. In the Quran it is unique. In, in the Quran he is the only one mentioned by that term, that likab, that title, Masih, only Jesus. But in the Bible, this is a very common expression. Messiah, Masih. You read there in the Bible, in this book of mine, Christ in Islam. I don't know whether they are available here, but from South Africa, we give them free. We have printed over 200,000 so far, free distribution. I give you references. So many references from the Bible where this word is used for other beings and things and things. Not only humankind, but inanimate objects. Anointed. The words you find is anointed. Anointed. The priests were anointed. The horns of the anointed. You know, they were those crown-like things, old-fashioned. They used to have horns on them, you know, to show that how fierce they were, you see, those rulers. Horns were anointed. Pillars, pillars, you know, column, column, were anointed. Columns were anointed. It says pots and pans, pots and pans were anointed. What is this? Anointed, pots and pans. Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, the word is Messiah. Pots and pans were Messiah. Pillars were Messiah. We made Messiah of pillars. So you have pillar messiah, you have pots, pots, you know pots and pans. You know the ladies cook with in cooking. You see, sometimes I know common terms, you know, I, I, I get puzzled. 
You see, because people might not have heard expressions like chalk and cheese. When I went to Canada, I found difficulty. You see, among the English-speaking peoples in Britain and in the colonies, chalk and cheese is a common expression. You know, chalk, the white uh, chalks of Dover, you know, cliffs of Dover. They know that it is made of chalk, and we used to use blackboard on which you used to write with chalk. So in Canada, I'm talking about chalk and cheese, means pose apart. You know, they look alike. Chalk and cheese might look alike, but you can't eat chalk, but you can eat cheese. Means pose apart, though they look alike. And they didn't know what I was talking about. Somebody had to draw my attention and said, these people don't know what chalk and cheese is. They know crayons. You see, crayon. They talk about crayon. They don't talk about chalk writing on the blackboard. Difficulty. Pots and pans. You people understand pots and pans? You know, vessels that you use for cooking? I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm not, <laughs> you know, it can happen I'm speaking English, but maybe it's of a type that you might not be, you know, used to. Mm. So, pots and pans were anointed. In Hebrew, Messiah. In Greek, Christos. Christos, from which we get the word Christ. They made Christ out of pots and pans. They made Christ out of pillars. And a pagan by the name of Cyrus, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 1. God says, it is I who have surnamed thee. What? Christ. I called you Christ, Messiah. That, that though thou dost not know me, Means you kafir, you polytheist, you pagan, you don't know me. He doesn't recognize God as the one and only God. You don't know me, yet I have my anointed, Cyrus, my anointed, in, in, in Hebrew, Messiah, in Greek, Christos, a pagan. God calls him Christ. If God Almighty calls a pagan, a mushrik, a polytheist, Christ? I said, what does it mean? The thing is that a game is being played by our translators of the Bible. Whenever it refers to other beings or things, they use the word anointed, anointed, anointed. So you're not associating with Messiah, Messiah, Christ, Christ. Can you see? Is that game they play in translating. So, I said, you see, this word Messiah or Christ doesn't mean God. If God can use that term for pagans, for pots and pans, for horns, for pillars, I said, what is Christ? No. We say, look, this is a respectful term we give to Jesus. He's anointed, appointed by God. He is a genuine man of God. But he's not God. The birth of Jesus, born without a human father. I said, that does not make him into a god. Because in the Bible, others are called greater than Jesus on that level. At question time, you have the privilege of asking me who, where, and I show you from the Bible that there are others greater than Jesus on the basis of birth, greater than Jesus, who deserves more worship than Jesus in the Christian Bible. This is our main point of difference. Now, the Quranic picture is that when Jesus when the annunciation was made, she says, how can this thing be when I know not a man? The biblical version is, we read in the Gospel of St. Luke, the very same story, almost identical. When the good news was given to Mary, the mother of Jesus, she says, how can this thing be when I know not a man? In the Quran, when no man had touched me, both meaning the same thing. It's only a choice of words. A choice of words, meaning the same thing. 100% meaning the same thing. I know not a man or no man has touched me, meaning sexually. I have had no relationship. How can I have a child? In the Quran, we are told, kun fayakun, be, and it was. The Bible says, when she uttered those words, that the Holy Ghost will come upon thee. The Holy Ghost will come on you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow thee. You see, I had gone to Johannesburg on one occasion. Johannesburg is the city of gold in South Africa. It is the largest inland city in the world. No river, no sea. The largest in the world, Johannesburg, remember that. It's in my country. Inland city. There are hundreds of other cities bigger than Johannesburg. But they are all on the river or all by the sea. This is the inland city, the largest. 
So I wanted to buy an Indonesian Bible. I was about to go to Indonesia. That was on my trip when I had come here in 1977. Excuse me. In 1977, I was here, and I had delivered a talk somewhere here in Tucson, in Phoenix, Arizona. That is on Phoenix. Phoenix, here, and on. I was on a lecture tour, but I was on my way to America, uh, to Indonesia. And I have a habit that if I go to a new country, I try to learn the language of the native of the place. Somehow, it opens up their hearts to me. If I can uh, utter some of the words in their language, you know, it's human nature. You know, you can get into the heart of a man better through his mother tongue than in a foreign language. So I wanted to have some knowledge of Indonesian. And I have an idea of getting this sort, sort of thing by getting the Bible in that language. See, because I know the Christian Bible, English Bible, extensively by heart. To such an extent that people often, you know, ask me, Do you, are you Hafiz or Bible? Have you become Hafiz? You know the whole Bible by heart? I said, no, I don't. The Quran, I says, no, I'm not Hafiz. So, if I want to learn a language, I go and get a Bible in that language. What I know in English, I look for it in their foreign language. So I wanted an Indonesian Bible. The Bible house in, in Durban didn't have it. So when I went to Johannesburg, I went to the Bible Society. And I was browsing through. I picked up a Bible. I wanted a, a type of uh, a new, type, new version. Then I picked up a Greek-English uh, translation of the New Testament, quite an expensive book. While I was doing that, the supervisor was watching me, you know, with my strange headgear and my beard. He was quite intrigued to find me handling those expensive volumes. So he walked up to me, and he started a conversation. I wanted to know what made me interested in this Greek, English, New Testament. So I gave him to understand that I am a student of comparative religion, and I can see I found something there that will be of help to me, so I'm interested. And he got interested in me, he says, would you like to come and have a cup of tea with me? Oh, I said, it's a privilege for me. So he took me into his office, wanted to know more about me. So I started to explain to him that, you see, we believe in Jesus. All that I told you, one of the mightiest messengers of God, his miraculous birth, his many miracles. And I started reading these verses from the Quran. Behold, the angel said, O Mary, and on and on. And the translation, and the translation. And I gave that if God wants to create, when he wants to create, he immediately says to it, be, and it is. When I had come up to that stage, he said, look, this is the same as my Bible. I said, no doubt. On the face of it, it's identical. If a Christian of any church or denomination, if he came across these verses of the Bible in English, without the Arabic text side by side, in a thousand years, he'll never guess he's reading the Quran. A Christian, any Christian, unless he's a scholar or is a missionary who had known beforehand what the Muslims believe. But if a page of this translation that I'm giving you was found on the floor and he picks it up, any Christian, whether Jehovah's Witness, Roman Catholic, Anglican, Presbyterian, Lutheran, anyone, you pick up this and you read it, he says, Behold, the angel said, O Mary, God give thee glad tidings of a word from him. His name will be Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, held in honor in this world and in the hereafter, and of the, and of the company of those nearest to God. And he will speak to the people in childhood and in maturity, and he shall be of the company of the righteous. She says, how can this thing be when I know not a man? The angel says in reply, he says, even so, God creates what he wills. Whenever he decrees a matter, he merely says to it, be, and it is. He says, man, this is something familiar. Very familiar. But I didn't read this before in my Bible. So maybe this is the Roman Catholic version of the Bible, if he hadn't read one. Maybe this is the Jehovah's Witness version of the Bible, if he hadn't read it. Maybe this is the Greek Orthodox version of the Bible, if he hadn't read it. He'll never guess he's reading the Quran. He'll never guess in a thousand years. So close. I said, yes, on the face of it, the same. But I said, you know, if you compare it closely, it's a difference of chalk and cheese. Chalk and cheese. <laughs> That's where I said chalk and cheese. He said, how? So I started explaining. I said, look, the, in the Quran we are told for God to create, he wills it. 
In the Bible, we are told that the Holy Ghost will come upon Mary. How? How? How is it going to come on her? How? And the power of the Most High will overshadow her. She overshadow thee. How? How? As a man or an animal, how does he overshadow? You see, now, we know it doesn't mean that. But the language is so down to earth, earthly, that you are giving the atheist and the agnostic a stick to beat you with. How did the Holy Ghost come upon her? And in the Gospel of St. Matthew, we are told that before they came together, Joseph and Mary, as husband and wife, she was found with child by the Holy Ghost. He had done the job. Holy Ghost. He had planted. The language is so down to earth, earthly. The Quran says, وَإِذَا قَدَىٰ أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا يَكُولُ لَهُ كُنْ فَيَكُونَ For him to, to create anything, he merely wills it and it comes into being. I said, between these two versions, there are two versions of the birth of Jesus. There are two pictures, Quranic and Biblical. I said, which would you prefer to give to your daughter? So he bowed his head down in shame and he said, I would prefer to give the Quranic version of the birth of Jesus. We are told, before we come to this, of the birth, he said that he will speak to the people in childhood and in maturity, as an infant, as well as as a mature man. And now we have a confirmation of this happening. This is a miracle, that as an infant, a child can speak. It's a miracle. We read in Surah Maryam, Maryam means Mary. There is a chapter in the Holy Quran in honor of the name of the mother of Jesus Christ. Maryam, Mary. There is not a book in the Bible which is a library of 66 books of the Protestants and 73 books of the Roman Catholics. 73 books inside. It's a library. It's an encyclopedia. This is an encyclopedia of 73 books. This is an encyclopedia of 66 books. There is not one book named Mary in honor of the mother of Jesus. There isn't. You have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Paul, Peter, Corinthians, Philippians, Galatians. But there's no Mary here. In this Quran is enshrined a chapter called Surah Maryam. Chapter Mary in honor of the name of the mother of Jesus Christ. We never take his holy name, the name of Jesus, or her holy name, the mother of Jesus, without respectfully saying, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, revered Jesus, may peace be upon him. All the prophets of Bani Israel, Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, revered Moses, may peace be upon him. Hazrat Dawood alayhi salam, revered David, may peace be upon him. Without saying Hazrat, revered, or saying peace be upon him, if a Muslim learned man, scholar, among us, delivering lectures to us, and if he said Isa, Jesus, will kick him out. Ron Kut Barbarian. Is this how you take the name of a mighty messenger of God? Isa. What Isa? Isa is Jesus. Or Musa. Musa, yes, we have so many Musas among us. But when we take the name of the Holy Prophet Moses, we say, Hazrat Musa, alayhi salam. This is how we talk. Maryam, alayhi salam. You know, peace be upon her. Maryam. Take her name with reverence, her son's name with reverence. Chapter, whole chapter dedicated to her in the Quran. In that chapter, we are told that after the birth of Jesus, the birth being peculiar in that this child was born without a human father, she returns. She had retired to a remote place in the east, according to the Quran, and after the birth of the child, she returns. Chapter 19, Surah Maryam describes. Says, at length she brought the babe to her people, carrying him in her arms. Qalu, they said, Ya Maryamu, laqad ji'ti shayan fariya. Says, truly, an amazing thing has thou brought. Shocked. We knew full well that you're not married, and now you come across, come with a child, shamelessly parading in the village, an illegitimate child. Ya ukhta Haruna, O sister of Harun, Ma kana abu kimra asawim wa ma kanat ummu ki baghiya. So your father was not a man of evil, nor was thy mother a woman unchaste. How have you brought this child without a father? Alleging that is illegitimate. What can she do? How can she explain? 
They were in no, meet, no mood to listen to her. They say, you know, I heard some voices. And God had given me that good news, and the child now is born. Were they in a mood to listen to such kind of trash from the point of view? Were they? No. Would you be, be, be prepared to listen to your sister telling you that? He says, you know, brother, you know, I heard some voices, and now this is the ninth month now. <laughs> huh? I was asking a missionary last night, one of Jimmy Swaggart's ministers, you know, teacher in his college, he was giving out his Christian literature in our meeting. Most uncouth kind of behavior. You go to somebody else's meeting, you take unfair advantage of them, giving your literature, pushing down people's throats, arguing, debating with them in the audience before the meeting and after the meeting, is uncalled for, uncalled for. For us Muslims to go to churches and doing that is uncalled for. You don't do things like that. Yes, you have every right to call people to your home, talk to them, give them tea, refreshment, share with them your knowledge, by all means. But you don't do that. You don't take unfair advantage of other people's meetings. You don't sponge upon people because of the good nature. Here is the man. And at the outside, after the end of the meeting, he started arguing and debating with me. So I'm asking him. I said, suppose. I said, look, the Quran says that Jesus was born miraculously. We accept. Read it. I want you to explain why would Muhammad come and tell us all these things. Because the easiest thing for a man to do, to get rid of your opposition, is to ridicule the man. So what are you talking about? A child was born without a husband, without a father. Huh? If your sister comes and tells you, I just described to you now, that she's carrying a baby and she heard voices, will you believe her? You know she never spoke a lie in, in her life as far as you know, never. Now she tells you she heard voices, you believe her. Your mother, I'm telling you, your mother, in the absence of your father, she said she had a dream about her husband, her husband, and now she's carrying this baby. Do you believe her? I say, your mother. He says, maybe, maybe. Your mother. She said, I dreamt of, of, of your father coming along and cohabiting with her, and now she's carrying a baby. You believe that? And this guy is a teacher in the college. He said, maybe, maybe. He says, you know. <laughs> I said, this is your moron. You are a moron. You know moron? A, a zombie. This is zombies and being cultivated. You can talk like that, that maybe your mother, you know, she had a dream and she's carrying a baby. Is this how children come about in dreams? From dreams? No. But is it, is it the lowness that which they can go? Just to prove that, no, this is in the right. I said, look, here, a woman, God Almighty says, says, this is my command. Act of will, she had a baby. We agree, we believe. Thousand million Muslims, no arguments. We don't argue. We accept because we know this mighty messenger of God had no reason to lie. What was he getting out of this? The easier way would have been to ridicule. So don't be a fool, man. What are you talking? Your sister, your mother, if she told you that, you believe her? He says, no. So how can you believe this Jewess 2,000 years ago? No, but we believe. Because who testifies? God is speaking through Muhammad, telling us so. We submit. Amanna Saddakma. says, we hear and we affirm. So, they are reasoning with her. I said, how, how is it that you have brought this child into the world without a husband? What can she say? She said, Fa'asha, the Quran says, Fa'asharat ilay, but she merely pointed to the babe, you know, to ask him. So they say, Qalu kaifa nukallimu man kana fil mahdi sabiyya. Said, how can we talk to one who's a child in the cradle? How can we talk to him, this little thing? What can he tell us? And by a miracle, Jesus spoke. From his mother's arms, defended his mother against an unbelieving audience. So qala inni Abdullah. Said, most certainly I am the servant of Allah. Atani al-kitab. He has given me revelation. Waja'alani nabiyya. And he has made me a prophet. He spoke and defended his mother. The first miracle attributed to Jesus in the Holy Quran is that he spoke as an infant from his mother's arms. The first miracle of Jesus Christ, the other picture, the first miracle. You read in the Gospel of St. John, I think it's chapter 3 at the beginning. Jesus and his disciples go to the marriage feast at Cana. Cana. And they run short of wine, W-I-N-E, wine. So his mother comes to him, 
and says, son, look, these people are in a problem. They have run short of wine. Help them out. Believing that he's got mysterious powers to help these people solve the problem. So Jesus blurts out, according to the Bible, he says, woman, woman, what have I to do with thee? My time is not yet. Woman. In the whole of the 27 books of the New Testament, not once does he call his mother, mother. Woman, woman. I'm asking in the Hebrew language, is there no word for mother? This word woman he uses for the prostitute. Same word. You see, the woman who was caught, caught in the act, they bring her to Jesus. He said, look, this woman, we caught her in the act. What must we do to her? They're putting him to the test. They're trying to get him embroiled with the government or with the religious authorities. Either way, he loses. If he says, stone her, that was the law, book of Leviticus, that the adulterer and the adulteress must be stoned to death. If he says, stone her as a man of God, he must abide by the law. Stone her. And they would have stoned her and killed her. And if they were apprehended by the law, by the government, they said, look, our Messiah told us to. This is what our Messiah said. So he's in conflict with the government. Because adultery was not a capital crime in the Roman Empire, nor is it today in Christendom. It is not a crime at all. Adultery is no crime. Did you know that? Adultery is not a crime in any Christian nation on earth. It's not a crime. The law will not hold you responsible for committing adultery. He calls the prostitute, woman, where are thine accusers? So he says, no, they're all gone. So he says, all right, go and sin no more. Woman. He says, there's not a single place he calls his mother, mother, in the Bible. So he says, woman, what have I to do with thee? My time is not yet. So she persuades him. He says, look, man, help them out. These people are in difficulty. He says, all right, fill up the vats. You know, the wine vats with water. And they fill it up. And he turned the water into wine. And they drank. And they remarked, the drunkards of the night who have been drinking, imbibing all night. They're remarking, why have you kept the best wine for the last? The best wine, why have you kept it to the last? So my brother Jimmy Swaggart, he says in his book that that wine was pure grape juice. I said, brother, I didn't have a chance to talk about that, but I said, brother, Swaggart, you see if a man has an imbibing wine, for whole night, and the things run dry, and you give him pure grape juice, that grape juice is like mud water to him, because there is a law involved. You drink 5% alcoholic drink, 5%, 5%, after a while, your senses are getting dulled. You need 10% to make you feel that it's alcohol, something to give you a kick. Then you need 20% to make you to feel that there's something, potency in it. You have to increase the alcoholic content to make you feel that it's better than the previous one, it's better than the previous one. If you give such a man grape juice, he says it's mud water, what is it? Insipid, no taste. <laughs> and he's telling us in his book called Alcohol, this is one of the, he's telling us, and I have no reason to contradict him unless you have, he said there are 11 million drunkards in America, 11 million drunkards. And 44 million heavy drinkers. Get that book, small book. I have a sample here, I think. Alcohol. 11 million drunkards and 44 million heavy drinkers. And he says, to me, there's no difference between the two. It means 55 million drunkards, as far as Jimmy Swaggart is concerned. In my country, they don't call them drunkards. It's an insult. The guy can punch you on the jaw if you call a man a drunkard. You have to call him alcoholic. You know, the poor man is sick. This is a sickness in his treatment. It's not a sin. Alcohol is not a sin. It's a sickness. Jimmy Swaggart calls a spade a spade. He said, drunkards. 55 million drunkards in America. 11 million drunkards and heavy drinkers. I said, I make no difference. I said, yes, brother. I said, go a step further. Islam will take you a step further. He said, even your social drinkers are on the same level. They're breaking the laws and commandments of God as given in the last and final revelation of God. The Holy Prophet Muhammad, he said, whatever intoxicates in greater quantity is forbidden even in smaller quantity. No excuse for a nip or a thought. The 
holy quran says ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu all you who believe innama al khamru most certainly intoxicants wal maisiru and gambling wal ansabu and fortune telling wal azlamu and idol worship rizum minam al shaitan are an abomination of satan's handiwork fajtanibuhu la'allakum tuflihun it's a shan such abomination that you may prosper and one pronouncement he created the biggest society of teetotalers in the world 1000 million muslims as a people as a whole they don't imbibe that filth we have our black sheep we are not all angels we know some muslims can bring the christian under the table that you know we are ashamed of them but as a people as a whole the biggest society of teetotalers people who don't imbibe are the muslims and what did it this word of god this is a miracle you perform a million miracles and you can't change people here without any miracles he transform nations this is a miracle what miracle are you talking about so the quranic first miracle of jesus he spoke and defended his mother against an unbelieving audience the first miracle of jesus he turned water into wine since then wine has flowed like water in christendom and there's no way out the preachers Jimmy Swaggart is telling us there's a book called Preachers, and he's telling us in that book, he said at a church conference, all these preachers, the evangelists, the hot gospelers, the Bible thumpers, you know, they call them evangelists, born again Christians, yes, at a conference, they asked somebody suggested this. Look, those people who are against the 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 against alcohol, please stand up, that you can go out when you return. Preach in your churches against the evil of alcohol. Please stand up. And Jimmy Swaggart says, nobody stood up. That means they all opted for alcohol. Why? And the reason, Jimmy Swaggart said, the reasoning is, he said, look, our Lord Jesus turned water into wine. If it is good enough for our God, it's good for us. Good logic. If it's good for your God, it's good for you. He says, that was pure grape juice. I said it is the same W I N E wine. Your Christian scholar says W I N E wine in Greek, as the Lot, the prophet Lot, according to the Bible, he drank and cohabited with his daughters, committed incest night after night. Same W I N E wine in Greek, that W I N E wine and this W I N E wine. I said the only way out is here. Yeah, the last and final revelation of God, Jesus Christ tells you that I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. You haven't got that capacity. You're not fit to receive. Solution to all the problems that I can give you. I can give, solve all the problems of mankind till doomsday. But you are not fit. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he say, he will guide you into all truth. The spirit of truth. For he shall not speak from himself. But what things shall he hear, that shall he speak. And he shall declare unto you the things that are to come. He shall glorify me. He said, that spirit of truth is Muhammad. And he truly glorified Jesus by absolving him from the calumnies of his enemies. His mother as well as Jesus. And the Christian world can never repay Muhammad for what he has done. What Muhammad has done for Jesus and for his mother. He is the true comforter, the true advocate of Jesus Christ. With these words, Mr. Chairman, I don't see the chairman around, but Mr. Chairman and my dear brethren, I stop here and give you the opportunity as was uh, suggested by the chairman that you have a time, you have the opportunity of asking questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, much, Mr. Leader, for this inspiring talk. I will now give a one-minute outline for the lecture for those who came late. Mr. Deedat started talking about the legitim legitimacy and the illegitimacy of the both children of Abraham. And then he talked about how the Jews looked down the Arabs 1,300 years ago, and they are still looking down at the Arabs now. He went further and he talked about Mary and her status, that he, she was not being married before the birth of Jesus, and how miraculously Jesus was born. He went again and he talked about the importance of believing on Jesus as an apostle in the Muslim point of view. In Islam, a Muslim is not a Muslim unless he believes that G Jesus, peace be with him, is a messenger of Allah. He explained uh, also 
He talked about alcohol and the problems of gambling, fortune telling, and the problems of all the problems that mankind suffer. And he showed both the viewpoints of Islam and what he had discussed with uh, Mr. Fuagar. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are not here to antagonize anybody, not to be little any religion, caste, or creed. We are here to learn and to get the benefit of the talk. Uh, Mr. Didat will now entertain questions, and he will answer questions. If you have any question, please feel free and come to the mic. According to the Quran, and I'll, I'll ad admit an, an ignorance of the Quran, okay? uh, was Jesus resurrected from the dead? The question was, according to the Quran, was Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead? Now, according to the Quran, he was neither killed nor crucified. See, the Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa qawlihim inna qatanna al-Masiha Isa ibn Maryam Rasulullah. That they said in boast that we kill Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God. In answer to that, God says, wa ma qataluhu wa ma salabuhu. That they didn't kill him, nor did they crucify him. Walakin shubbiha lahum, but it was made to appear to them so. And those who dispute therein are full of doubts. They have no certain knowledge. They only follow conjecture, guesswork, fiction. For a surety, they killed him not. And I'm going to have a debate with a great Christian in your country of the Zwemer Institute, I think the night after tomorrow or tomorrow night in Kansas. Uh, Dr. Robert Douglas on the subject of was Christ crucified and I will prove from the Christian Bible not from the Quran the Quran says they didn't kill him and they didn't crucify him we are satisfied but no to satisfy the Christian I will show to them from the Christian Bible that brothers you have misunderstood the whole thing you are reading something and actually you're misunderstanding it and I'll be proving that tomorrow night is it tomorrow night uh, Tomorrow night in Kansas City, we are having a debate with um, Robert Douglas, Dr. Robert Douglas of the Zwemer Institute. We will deal with this subject fully there. Now the gentleman on the left. A little less than uh, a year ago, two of my dear friends were thrown to prison in a large Muslim country for talking to Muslims about Jesus. Indeed, in most countries that are predominantly Muslim, one cannot go and freely talk about Jesus without the fear of prison or even death. Question, how can this be true if it cannot stand up in the marketplace of ideas without the protection of a gun or prison? Indeed, does not the truth welcome criticism and debate? I would kindly request whoever asks a question to limit the question to the merit of the discussion. However, I will give Mr. Didet a chance to answer this question. But whoever has a question, please limit it, because Mr. Didet here is not to defend what governments are doing. He is only here to explain what he explained already. Now, Mr. See, the question is quite a rhetoric one about Muslim governments, their policies with regards to people coming in and perverting their people. From the point of view of the Muslim, is a perversion. From the worship of the one good, true God, people want to take away our children and worship human beings created beings. To us, it is the highest form of blasphemy. Worship, instead of worshipping God, worshipping his creation, creatures. So if the governments are trying to defend, I'm not defending them, but I said if they are trying to defend in the best interests of the people, that is their business. But now, at the same time, it also poses another question from my side, that the Christian missionaries, you'll have to now acknowledge that they're using deceitful methods, deceitful. Look at this. Look at this. This book here, no Muslim child will ever think that this is Christian. Look at this, Al-Kitab, Arabic calligraphy. You see, deceiving the Muslims in the guise of Islamic book, this. At close view, if you have, you see, you know, how easily the Muslim is t being taken up by this. Al-Kitab, this calligraphy is Islamic, but actually is the Gospel of St. Matthew. 
Can you imagine? Deceit. Now, I want to know whether your Christianity allows you to deceive people. In Pakistan, on my way, I delivered a lecture. While I am walking out, people all around, they surround me, they're shaking hands, you know, congratulating me. A small boy, about 12 or 14, he comes to me and he presents these three to me. This. This. Look at this. He presents this to me. I take it. I felt like kissing it. That's our habit. You know, Allah's kalam, if we come across, we kiss it, but the crunch was too great. People, you know, so I put it quickly in my pocket. For about three to four days, I had no chance of taking it out. Believe me, I'm not exaggerating. You know, I'm moving from place to place. I have no time. I mean, I go to the hotel, I'm tired. I take off my jacket and throw it down one side. Then in Abu Dhabi or somewhere, I took it out and put this on my t table next to the bed. Still, I'm not looking what it is what it is, then now to move further, I said, now let me weed out all these papers that I've collected. And I start looking at this. I'm reading. Allah Muhammad. Look at it. Allah Muhammad. I'm reading. Allah Muhammad. Hmm. I turn the back. It's calendar. Another one. Beautiful calligraphy. Islamic calligraphy. Look at this. In a hundred years, the Muslim child will never know what he's harboring in his house. Sticker, beautiful sticker. He's going to stir this out and put it in the Quran. Stick it in the Quran. You know what? Deceit. Christian missionaries, this is what they're doing to our people now. Deceiving them. This one here. This is back of it. He said, the Lord's Prayer. He said, Lord's Prayer? We don't talk like that. The Lord's Prayer says, Al-Fatiha. We say Al-Fatiha, the opening chapter, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, Ar opening chapter, the Lord's Prayer. So what's this? Abba na? Abba. Say, O oh, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven in Arabic. Calligraphy, deceitful. You see what you're doing? Deceiving the people. This one here is not Allah Muhammad. For a week I couldn't see it. Look at this. Everybody says Allah Muhammad. Am I right? What do you see? It's not Allah Muhammad. It's Allah Muhabba. God is love. Deceiving people. I ask you, my brother missionary. You see, you're protesting. I said, look, is this your way of propagating your faith? If you have something good, something, why don't you go out openly and talk to them? Give them your calligraphy, your language. Why? What are you trying to catch fish with? What are you doing now? Deceiving people. And here, another one. Coming from Ghana, a letter addressed to the Arab countries. I must read it to you. I must read it to you. What they are trying to do now. They are sending parcels, literature, into Muslim countries. And on the top of it, they put rubber stamps. This is asking now, do you think that if I send you bigger parcels, about twice or thrice the size, size sizes I sent you with our franking stamp, which has the name Islamic Madrasatul. Islamic Madrasatul. I don't know what it really means. But as soon as the postman, the government man says, is there Islamic Madrasatul inside. Your religion allows you to deceive people like that? In the guise of, you know, Jesus Christ truly described them. He says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. They're trying to deceive you. You must be beware of them. So, brother, I'm not defending my Arab brothers. In Pakistan, you have the freedom there. Pakistan, your missionaries are making inroads. In Bangladesh, you have the freedom there. In India, you have the freedom there. See? In Indonesia, Malaysia, you have the freedom there. If some Arabs, you know, are more stringent in the regulations, but you're still getting through. Look, by deceit, by post, by radio, you're getting through. So what are you complaining about? What is your complaint? We have a legitimate complaint. Books that the Christians write. Every book. Inside, why I became a Christian. Sultan Muhammad Paul. When you flip the pages, verses from the Quran. For the Muslim, these verses are sacred, sacrosanct. Every child, every grown up will kiss it and put it next to the Quran. Why? Because Allah's kalam is, he will not tear it, he will not burn it. You know the psychology of the Muslim and you're taking unfair advantage of it. Look at this. From Sufism to Islam, John Abdul Subhan. Look at this. Deceit? Does your religion allow you to deceive people like this? Catching fish? No, you tell me. 
So what are you crying about? What are you complaining about? In Africa, you have 35,000 full-time crusaders. Billy Graham, I'm sorry, Jimmy Swaggart, he's boasting that he's getting th through to 22 million Muslims through his radio service, 22 million. I'm asking, what are you crying about? Please. Don't, you know, like, you know, bashful maidens, you know, when you do the things, you're hurting the people's feelings, you're trying to steal our children, and now, when somebody tries to do some type of protection, you're wailing like a woman. Please don't do that. Ladies and gentlemen, the whole lecture will be available on a cassette tape, and it could be uh, available at the Islamic Center of Tucson, address 1627 East, First Street, Tucson, Arizona, 85719, and the telephone number there is 325-8992. Repeat, the address is 1627 East First Street, Tucson, Arizona, and the zip code is 85719. And not only this lecture is available there, you could request several lectures of Mr. Didet and some other scholars also, if you want to broaden your background about this. Uh, also, we have about 15 more minutes for the questions and answers. You are kindly requested. If you have any question, please feel free and come to the mic. Now the gentleman on the right can start. First of all, I'd like to clarify a point. Um, Earlier on tonight, you made a statement involving incarnation, involving a comparison of Christianity with Hinduism. Well, to, to clarify a point, we do not believe that the purpose of Jesus Christ coming down in the form of man was for the simple reason of understanding man's problems, but instead to take on the sin of the world. And because of that, there is no real parallel between an incarnation of comparing Hinduism faith with the faith of Christianity. And second, the point that I'd really like to address your entire issue tonight is that it seemed to me that it was more not necessarily who is Christ and what is his purpose but it was more like an attack upon men Christian men your men I mean I, I appreciate I appreciate Mohammed and I appreciate all the great prophets but it's God that is above all of us and you know, we really have no right to compare ourselves on the same standpoint. And so to bring in man versus man is really irrelevant when it comes to God and Christianity and the Muslim faith. And so I'd like to know not necessarily what you believe on the attack of a Jimmy Swaggart or a Pat Robertson or your own people, but instead I'd like to know where is it you stand on Jesus Christ in comparison to God and your Muslim faith in a comparison between faith, not men. I thought I made it abundantly clear with regards to what we accept Jesus to be. I said, and I repeat, that Jesus Christ, we believe, was one of the mightiest messengers of God. I said, we believe in his miraculous birth, which many modern day Christians don't believe today. We believe in his many miracles including those of giving life to the dead by God's permission and of healing bo those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. Then I said, there is a parting of the ways. And that is, you say that he's God, we say he's not God. You say he's God incarnate, we say God does not incarnate. Is that an attack? Or is this putting forth to you our position, said, look, this is our position, instead of hypocritically telling you, you know, he performed many miracles and what he did and he spoke as a child and all that, and says, now I scratch your back and you scratch my back. Was that what I was trying to do? I said, look, we accept all these things. We are going together. Here is the parting of the ways. We say, he's not God and he's not God incarnate because God does not incarnate. And he's not the begotten son of God because begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex. And we are not to attribute such a quality to God. Now, this is the Muslim stand. If that goes against your grain, against your belief, now you have every right to ask. Mr. D, that you see, Jesus is God. So what makes him God is he had no father. So some, every, every person must have a father. So I have to agree, yes. So Jesus must also have a father. So if you can't show a father, who is his father? I said, no, he has no father. He said, no, his father is God. What have you to say now? So he is the begotten son of God. He's God's only son. Talk like that. 
So what have you to say? We believe in the Holy Trinity. Father, Son and Holy Ghost. You know, this is what our book says now. Do you accept the Trinity? Talk like that. The first question, he did a beautiful job. He said, look now, we believe about Christ. Resurrection. So I said, look, if there's no death, there's no resurrection. Talk like that. Look, this is the question. So I said, now you want me to justify, even now, you want me to justify. I said, look, I'll show you from your own book that you read something and you misunderstand the thing that you're reading. Let's put it to the audience. Let us put it to you. But now you, I said, you're crying now like a woman, you know, bashful maiden. You said, now look, you, said, you attack. What attack? What did I say disparaging about Jesus? You say that he called his mother woman in your book. I said, my book says, he says, Wabarambi walidati. He says, made me kind to my mother. Wajalani jabbar and shakia. And he's not made me, uh, oh, oh, oh. oh. And not, you know, aggressive or abusing. Look, this is the Quran is defending Jesus. That he never did anything that you are attributing to him. That he called the learned men of Israel. He's the elders of his people. You generation of vipers. You whited sepulchers. You wicked and adulterous generation. You snakes. You fools. Look, this is your record. My book says, no, he never did anything like that. Is that an attack? If that is an attack, then, brother, you know, I apologize by God. You know, I'm ashamed of myself. If this is an attack, the Quran says that he didn't do that. He respected his mother. That's an attack. Is that an attack? That he didn't abuse the people. Is that an attack? No, you must tell me what, what is the attack? What is the attack? What, what did I say abusive about Jesus? I say he's one of the mightiest messengers of God. We love him. We respect him. We revere him. And I, we say, follow him. Follow him. Because if you followed him, you'll be a Muslim. You're not following him. However, the opportunity to the questioners, please, go ahead. Uh, in fact, uh, what I want to talk is the, uh, the my question is: uh, I believe all the gospel, the, the the Torah, and the the Quran itself, and the God also revealed the the, the gospel and the, and the Bible and the Torah for guidance and light. But my question is, we see the error, or you pointed out the error of Christianity by saying that they worship according to the will of God. How about on the second side, on the other side of the coin, that also Muslims worship according to the will of God by idolizing hadith, tales, all these things. Why don't we see on the other side also? Because these people, we say that we follow the Quran, but they follow hadith, tales, a narration of other people which are not the words of God, totality. How do you see these things? I, I, you see, I think you have missed the mark. What I, the subject was, I don't know whether you people know, when you say the subject was two pictures of Jesus, Quranic and Biblical. Now the brother is coming out with something about the Muslims now, they're idolizing a book. Which book are they idolizing? Which book are you idolizing? Which book are you worshipping? We pray to Allah, we make salat, give zakat, go for pilgrimage, you know, we abstain from evil. I don't know what is the question. Where is what tr troubling you? I don't know. You see, the subject was about Jesus. Now you're talking about books and idolizing books. Which Muslim is worshipping a book? I want to know. Then I'll deal with that Muslim. But if you are that Muslim, then you tell me, which book are you idolizing? Okay, can, I ask, can I ask? No, no, look, please. This was supposed to be question time. There are so many people behind you. Please give them an opportunity. Yes, please. Okay, thank you. My, my question is one of curiosity. If, if the Muslim believes in Jesus Christ as being a prophet, then I assume that means that they're revering his message and what he was. So my curiosity is one in the Christian description of him, say by the prophet Isaiah, when he's referred to as the coming Messiah being Emmanuel, translated as God with us, and also in the men that he was with, that he trained up, who, when they relate his story, relate frequent instan instances where he, they say that no man comes to God but through me, and that I am the bread, the truth, the life, that I am God. So it's, I'm curious about how you handle that. It's a very, very pertinent and straightforward question. Straight request, you know, it calls for my response on that level. You see, uh, there are quotations in the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament where 
a description is given about somebody, something, maybe the Messiah. It says, and he shall be called, I'm quoting, called Emmanuel, which means God with us. He shall be called Emmanuel. Now I'm asking people, I said, look, you've got 27 books in the New Testament, 27 books. In any one of these books, is it ever mentioned anywhere that Jesus was ever called Emmanuel? Was he called Emmanuel? He was called Jesus. He was called the Messiah. He was called the bread of life. He was called this, <laughs> the truth of God. All that, the word of God. Was he ever called Emmanuel in any one of these 27 books? Was he? No. So it means it's not referring to him. He shall be called. Like you see, the man comes along, he's going to lecture to you people on the subject, uh, two pictures of Jesus, Quranic and Biblical, and that man shall be called the Messiah. Now, did anybody call me Messiah? No. So it's, there's no fulfillment. Can you see? If I wasn't called Messiah, I'm not the Messiah. He was called, and he, nobody ever called him. He shall be called. I said, you see, that refers to Muhammad. Because Muhammad, you see in the Quran, in the Holy Quran you read, that Muhammad and Abu Bakr at the flight, they were in a cave and they were almost being caught out. And Abu Bakr says, he says, look man, they are almost, they are upon us. We are done for. And Muhammad says, Inna Allah ma'ana, Emmanuel. Inna Allah, God is with us, Emmanuel. Muhammad said that, not Jesus. Jesus on the cross, he said, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. You see, at the critical moment, when you have God with you, who says that? Muhammad says that. Inna Allah ma'ana, which is the exact translation of Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus says, according to your record, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God is not with him. He's forsaken by God. That's at the critical moment. So this is not referring, nowhere referring to Jesus. With regards to Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Mr. D, Dad, what have you to say to that? I said, I have to respond. He did say that. I am the way. He is the way. You see, in the context, now let's have a look at it in the context. You see, the disciples of Jesus misunderstood everything. Everything he spoke, they misunderstood. And his present-day disciples and followers misinterpret everything he uttered with apologies. You see, this is in John chapter 14. At the beginning, we are told, Jesus says, In my father's house there are many mansions. Had it not been for so, uh, so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. And whither I go, ye know. And the way, ye know. You know where I'm going, and you know how to get there. In other words, I assume you understand what I'm talking about. He's telling his disciples, do you know where I'm going and you know how to reach that destination? So they say, Lord, we know not whither thou goest and how can we know the way? In other words, they misunderstood. Jesus is talking about spiritual matters, spiritual goals, spiritual destination. They are thinking of geographical locations, Washington, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, what? They think, it's a look, we don't know where you are going and how are we going to get there? Look, misunderstanding. He's talking about spiritual things, they're thinking of geographical, geographical places. So Jesus in answer to that says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It means if you want to know where I'm going, look at me. The way to God is personified in me. Look at me. The truth of God is personified in me. Look at me. True life is personified in me. Look at me. If you follow me, you will reach your destination. And they misunderstood again. No, it was too heavy for them. Too heavy for them, for his disciples. The simple statements, they can't understand. Everything they're misunderstanding. So they said, look, Lord, show us the Father and it suffice at us. Look, all this you're talking about is too heavy for us. Too heavy. We don't know what you're talking about. Just show us God. If you can see God, we'll be satisfied. In answer to that, Jesus says, Philip, you have been with me for so long. You know, you ought to know better than that. You are a Jew. 
And as a Jew, you know, no man can see God and live. God is not seen at any time. That's what the scriptures say. He's not seen at any time. And no man can see God and live. If you see God, you'll be consumed. And you with me for so long? And you're still asking such a silly, making such a silly request? You want to see God with your bodily eyes when you can't look at the sun? He said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Meaning, if you understood what I am, you would have understood what God is. Same John is talking other places, seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. Means you see and you don't see. If you have seen me, meaning not physical seeing, because Philip had no defect in his eyes. If he had, Jesus would have healed him. If he can heal other people from the blindness, why not his disciple of his def defect in sight? No, he's not talking about physical sight. Means if you have seen me, if he had that has seen me, then if you understood what I am, you would have understood what God is. You wouldn't, you wouldn't make such a silly request, wanting to see God with your bodily eyes. Way to God, you see, the, every prophet of God, in his own time, in his own dispensation, is the only way to God. In the time of Moses, Moses was the way to God. If you wanted another way, the children of Israel chose another way, through the golden calf, for which 24,000 people were killed. The Jews, killing Jews. God's command says, destroy them. This rubbish, you know, they're worshipping a calf, kill them. One book says 23,000, other says 24,000. We're killed for that. Why? Because they chose another way. There's only one way to God, is through the way of the prophet of God. The prophet of the time, he tells you, in the time of Noah, Noah was the way to God. You want to be saved? Get into the ark. That's all. No fasting, no prayer, no zakat, no pilgrimage, nothing. Just get into the ark. Salvation is yours. That's all. You see, he's the way to God. Anybody who got in, saved. From physical destruction as well as spiritual destruction. Listening, hearken to the prophet of God. In the time of Jonah, Jonah was the way. In the time of Jesus, Jesus was the way. In the time of Muhammad, this is his dispensation. Muhammad is the way. If you want another way, it will not be accepted from you. Because Christ told you that when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He had the message. He had the solutions. But now he didn't have the time. The poor man is on the run. As soon as he opened his mouth, the Jews were after his blood. And a man on the run, he's got no time to give you all the teaching. So he said, I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. How be it? When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He said, that spirit of truth is Muhammad. And we are prepared to reason with you. Let us have a dialogue. I have written a book called What the Bible Says About Muhammad. This deals with prophecies from the Old Testament. I have delivered a lecture on Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ. It's available on videotape. I haven't had a chance to write the book yet. But inshallah, God willing, I'll write the book. You see? So in other words, now let us have a dialogue. Who is the spirit of truth? Who is the comforter? And what does this mean when he says, I'm the way, the truth and the life. He is the way to God. He is not the goal. To the Christian, he is the goal, he is not the way. He said that we must talk and reason how I see it, how you see it. And by that we might arrive at truth. What truth is, really is. However, the next question. Huh? I've been so fascinated with everything you've been saying. I'd love to sit down and talk with you, but I feel that this is the closest opportunity I'll get to do that. So um, I had to narrow my many questions down to this one. Um, does does God, according to the Islam faith, provide forgiveness for sins? And if so, how do we know that? What is, what is God's promise to us that... How does he provide that promise? I'll answer that. And, okay. I'll answer that. When you say, and, you see now, this is an old machine. Old machine. So while I'm answering one, I forget the other. And then you might think that I try to hoodwink the people and you. So hmm. therefore, if you ask one question at a time, you'll be more merciful to me. <laughs> Then you take a chance, another one, and another one, I don't mind. Till 12 o'clock tonight, I'm at your disposal. Okay. But if you can, just one at a time, so it makes it easy for me. Please. Okay. Right. Okay. Do, does God, according to the Islam faith, provide forgiveness for sins? Yes. That forgiveness of sin is, you sincerely repent of the wrongs that you have done. God forgives. He does not need blood, the blood of animals, or of mankind, no blood. He says in the Holy Bible, he says in the book of Isaiah, he said, I forgive sins for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. 
What he wants from you is come to him, sincerely make an effort, and forgive. And the parable in the Bible, the prodigal son, if you remember, prodigal son, in the Gospel of St. Luke, prodigal son, father, a father had two sons. Who is the father in this parable? God. He is the father. He's got two sons, means two types of his creation. One was who remains with the father, you know, prays, does everything, nice, good chap, goody, goody, good fellow. The other fellow, like most of us, he says, look, dad, give me my inheritance, what belongs to me, my talents, all the talents, give it to me, and I will make into the world and fend for myself. And the loving father he said, all right, I know it's not good for you, but since you asked for it, have it, there, take it. And the son took it, which we all take. See, the talents, he's given us a lot of talents. And he went out into the world, as the gospel describes, and met bad company, mixed with bad company, became a drunkard and what and not, maybe had AIDS and everything, is lying in the gutter, you know, missing his pants. Now in that condition he realizes that he would have been better off if he was with the father, so he makes a comeback. He makes a comeback. And the father sees him from afar, says the gospel. And the father runs to the son. He says, this my son was dead, is now alive. He was lost, is now found. He wasn't dead. Spiritually he had departed. So that was death. He was lost spiritually. Now he's found. So he embraces the son, welcomes him, and tells the other son, he says, look, sacrifice the fatted calf that we may celebrate the return of the prodigal. Whose calf? Whose calf was that? The father's. See, the father out of his bounty, he makes the sacrifice. He's not asking his son, he said, look, you squandered all my talents, all my wealth. Now you go and stay with the swines, the pigs, in the pig sty for seven years. Look after the pigs, and after that I'll give you promotion to the sheep and, and the cows before you come into the house. That is not God. That's Shylock. Shylock talks like that. God Almighty, you make a sincere effort to return. He says, come, welcome. No price asked, no blood, no sacrifice. If he says, sacrifice is called for, it is his own. Out of his own goodness, he says, I'm prepared to celebrate. He celebrates your homecoming. And the book of Ezekiel, chapter 20, tells us the very same situation, same principle. He says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Means you who do wrong, you'll perish. Unfortunately, in Christian literature, there's a full stop. No Christian literature ever completes the verse. They put a full stop. Where there's no full stop, they put a full stop. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. And they say, all have sinned, and so they have fallen short of the glory of God. Everybody perishes. No, no, please, continue. It's a semicolon there in the King James Version. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Father Adam sinned. We his children, we will not bear that iniquity. Neither shall the father be the iniquity of the son. The son shall not be the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father be the iniquity of the son. His son, Adam's son, we, his children. Last June, in San Francisco, 300,000 sodomites, you call them gays, they gathered on a pilgrimage led by 50 lesbians on motorcycles. God will not ask Adam, he said, look at your children, that's all right. what are they doing? They're going to get AIDS, they'll get AIDS. No, God won't ask Adam. See, this is the law of God. He says, the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. And the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. The good thing the good man does, God says he'll get his reward. And the wicked fellow does wicked things, he will be punished. Way of salvation is there. He says, but if the wicked will turn, means repent, come back. But if the wicked will turn from all the sins that he has committed and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. That is salvation. You come back, you come back where God wants you to be, you ask for forgiveness, God will forgive you. He's not like Shylock, wanting a pound of flesh from you. He doesn't do that. He forgives sins for his own sake, not for your sheep and goats and Christ. Nothing. He wants nothing. He wants, needs no blood. He wants you. Your sincere effort wanting to come back. This is salvation. Um, I have read the Quran, but perhaps not as thoroughly as I might have, so please forgive any ignorance that I exhibit. Um, <clears throat> this evening you've made it very clear that there are severe discrepancies, um, even contradictions between the Gospels and the Quran. And 
yet I seem to remember that the Quran regards the Gospels very highly, and I was wondering if you could clarify for me what the precise Quranic position is on the Gospels. The term Gospel, translated into Arabic, is Injil. And we in Islam, we say, we believe in the Torah, we believe in the Zabur, we believe in the Injil, and we believe in the Furqan. Furqan is the Quran. We believe in all these heavenly books, as books from God. So, the Injil, translated into English, say Gospel. Gospel into Arabic is Injil. So, what does the Quran say, or the Muslims say, about the Injil? I say, Injil, we believe in. Injil is the revelation which God Almighty gave to the Holy Prophet Jesus. Whatever God gave him is the Injil. We read in the scriptures, in the Matthew, Gospel of St. Matthew, that Jesus went somewhere and he preached the Gospel. Translated, Injil. Mark says he went to a certain other place and he preached the Gospel. Injil. Luke says he went to some place and he preached the in Gospel. Injil. Then John tells us that Jesus went to a certain place and he preached the in Gospel. Injil. I am asking that Injil was Matthew, Mark, Luke and John under his arm. Did he have it? Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Acts, Corinthians, Philippians, Galatians, Thessalonians, you know, James. Is that what he had under his arm? The answer is no. What did he have? A book. Did he? No. It is the revelation which God gave him. That is what he was preaching. The knowledge that God gave him, he was preaching. That is what we believe in. It's from God. We speak very highly of it. But now what you are presenting to us is the gospel according to St. Matthew, the gospel according to St. Mark, the gospel according to St. Luke, the gospel according to St. John, which you in your Arabic translations translate as Injile Matthew, Injile Marcus, Injile Lucas, Injile Johanna. That's how your scholars translate these gospels. Injile, Matthew, Luca, Marcus, Lucas, Johanna. I said, look, we are believing in the Injile Isa, the Injil that was given to Jesus, not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if you can produce the Gospels according to Saint Jesus, that is what we believe in. We'd like to see that, if you have it. That is the one that we respect and revere. I hope that makes it clear. Earlier there was, there was a question in reference to I am the way, the truth, and the life that you answered. And I found it to be a very logical answer, but there was something that I found kind of missing in the puzzle. When, when he is referring to I am the way, the truth, and the life, all of us being intelligent people, I'm sure we're to see even being a literalist in the sense that that is what it is saying, I am the way, the truth, the life. Now, had it been that he was the prophet of the time, and there was David and Solomon and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, before him, had it been a sense to where he was put on the same level of those other prophets, and they all were the way, the truth, and the life, according to that period of time, I find it interesting that at no time in, the, in my biblical knowledge of the Bible does it ever state that King David or King Solomon, or in any reference, anybody else ever made the mention, I am the way the truth, and the life. If they were indeed the way, the truth, and the life at that time, why is it that they never made that same statement? You see, there are so many ways of saying the same thing. So many ways. You say the same thing, you don't put it in that order. Like the very fact, the fact of salvation, you know, being saved. When I said in the time of Moses, now you have to now tell me that it wasn't so. In the time of Moses, I say Moses was the way to God. In the time of Abraham, Abraham was the way to God. He's telling people, he said, look, if you want to get to God, behave like this. This is what you do, God will love you and forgive you your sins. That is, in other words, he said, look, look at me, the way I'm doing, the way he prayed, Moses, the people must pray. The way he fasted, they must fast. The way he abstained from all Ill, evil, they do the same. If they cut a goat, he must, they must also cut a goat. Whatever the prophet of God of the time does, the people must follow. You don't just say, look, I am the way, the truth. The same statement he must make, or did Jesus make such a statement? That also you can't prove. But we accept it. That look, he could have said that. 
But did he say that in that form? Did he, what language did he speak? You have it in Greek. You have the whole thing written in Greek. Did he speak Greek? Which is not the case because a man, Jew, coming to the Jews will speak the Jewish language. It doesn't make sense that he's going to speak to them in Greek. When you preserve the word Allah, Allah, Lama Sabachthani. You see, to show you that he spoke his own mother tongue. But the rest of the Gospels, his preachings, not preserved in his language. So now we are not going into all the details. But the fact of the matter is, you can see the spirit of what he's saying is, follow me. He said, he is not of me, who does not take his cross and follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Did he want you to get crucified? No. The way I carry my responsibility, you carry yours. That is the way. He says, verily, verily, I say unto you, most assuredly, I'm telling you, except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no heaven for you, unless you're better than the Jew. And I'm asking, how can you be better than the Jew by not keeping the laws and the commandments? He says, think not that I'm come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am come not to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, heaven and earth shall pass away, but one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, or shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall teach and do, shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Ask my Christian brethren, ask them, do you keep the laws and the commandments? He says, no. I said, why don't you? He says, now we are living under grace. The law is nailed to the cross. I said, where did you get that? So he says, Philippians, Galatians, Corinthians, Thessalonians. So who's this? What's this? Who's that? He says, Paul, 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 Paul. I said, who is your Lord and Master? He said, Jesus. I said, what did Jesus say? Nobody knows. Nobody ever quotes Jesus. I said, look, this is what Jesus said. You are not of me if you don't take up your cross and follow me. The way I carry my responsibilities, you carry yours. It's a manly religion he's preaching, not a soft soaping, you know, cowardly religion. Somebody else pays for your sins. You get AIDS and Jesus takes the injections. Imagine, you get VD, gonorrhea, and Jesus takes the injections. Does it make sense? You have a headache and Jesus takes the pill. Does that make sense? No. I said, look, he's a manly religion, but now you have misunderstood the whole thing. You are not following Jesus. You're not listening to Jesus. If you listen to Jesus, you'll be a Muslim. You are following Paul, 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 Paul. He derailed Jesus' teaching. Derailed the whole thing. You don't have to do any good works today to be saved. You just believe in the blood, says Paul. Jesus says, you must be better than the Jew. Otherwise, no heaven for you. I'm asking between the two of them, who must you listen? Jesus says the disciple is not greater than the master. The master is Jesus. A million disciples tell you to go and eat pigs. You can now eat pigs because Peter had a dream. The master says, thou shalt not eat the flesh of the swine because he confirms the law of Moses to the letter. One jot or one tittle, jot is the smallest letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Not even that amount is to go out of the law, he says. And you have done away with the whole law. He says not even that much. And whosoever shall do such a thing is called the least in the kingdom of heaven. You worthless rubbish, garbage. That's what he says. But you don't follow him. Therefore, you see Michael H. Hart. He wrote a book. Michael H. Hart here in America, New York. Hart Publication Company. The hundred or the top hundred or the greatest hundred in history. He gives us a list of 100 most influential men in history. From Adam alayhi salam, from Adam to current times. He gives you a list of these hundred great names. And then he puts them in their order of seniority. Who is number one? Who is number 10? Who is number 99? And he puts Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa number one. The first person in that hundred list is Muhammad. Jesus Christ, his Lord and Savior, number three. So he has to answer, account for it. He just can't just, maybe some Arab bribe the fellow, you know, to say, look, put Muhammad number one and put your God number three. It's possible, but not probable. It wouldn't enter the Arab mind to do such a thing. You see, I wish they had done these things, but they haven't. They can't use that money that way. They have other ways of using it. Why does he put Jesus Christ number three? Because he says the honor for Christianity is to be shared between Paul and Jesus. In actual fact, Paul is the real founder of Christianity, not Jesus Christ. 
And you see in the writings of all the evangelists, what are they teaching? You see, Paul, 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 Paul. Nobody tells you what Jesus says. Jesus says you must not even look upon a woman to lust after her. Whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her, has committed adultery with her already in his heart. But they all dance with other people's wives and daughters. They preach this in Sundays. They put you into ecstasy. Sermons, what Jesus said. But as soon as they go out, they're dancing with other people's wives and uh, daughters. With bare backs and bosoms almost coming out with a few drinks to weaken the resistance. And they think nothing of it. Why? Because Jesus has, didn't have the time to explain. So he said, somebody else is coming after me who will guide you into all truth. And that spirit of truth is Muhammad. That comforter is Muhammad. I look forward, next time when I come here, inshallah, I'd like to deliver a, talk, a, a lecture on that subject. However, you have the opportunity. In, in reference to my um, previous question, you did... You did uh, satisfy the, the question that God does provide forgiveness for sin. Um, what, I'm, I'm curious that if, if he does do this, what, how, can, how can people of the Islam faith be, be certain that they have been forgiven, be certain that they'll make it to heaven, that they will finally reach the destination? You see, the mis Muslim is given a formula. The formula is same as I read out to you from the book of Ezekiel. Same, no difference. That, but if the sinner, if the sinner will repent from all that he has done and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live. He shall not die. I mean, spiritually, he will not be destroyed. If you repent and now try to the best of your ability, you try to do right, it is acceptable in the sight of God. The very fact that now you eschew what you have done, you might make, you might fall again, and again, a million times. But sincerely, if you repent to God, He will overlook your faults and forgive you a million times. This is the God of mercy. You say He's a God of love, then He must be a God of love. He's not like Shylock wanting his pound of flesh. Look, you slipped, and now I must make you to pay for it. You made this mistake, I must now twist your ears, I must pull your eyebrows, I must pull your eyelashes. This is not God. You know, this is Shylock you're describing to me. God is not Shylock. He forgives sins, the Bible says. He said, I forgive sins for my own sake, not for your sheep and goats and cows and blood. For my own sake. The thing you have to do is like the prodigal son. Just make up your mind to return. That's all. You made a mistake? He says, I repent, O oh Lord, to the, forgive me, and I will not do it again. Maybe you fall again. Sincerely. You say, Oh Lord, I have fallen again. Forgive me. And he'll forgive you. A million times. Because he's not Shiloh. He doesn't want blood. He wants you. He's a loving father in heaven. We believe in that. But now the concept that the Christian gives, that he must have blood. We say, this is not God. Adam and Eve sinned, says the Christian. They ate the forbidden fruit, for which they were kicked out. Kicked out of the garden. I'm asking, is that not punishment enough? From felicity, anything they wanted, they could have had. They want grapes, oh, it's there. They want chops, mm, it's there. Everything they wanted, no exertion, no sweating. They got everything. Now they kicked out from that condition. Is that not punishment enough? No, says the Christians, not enough. So God goes out of his way now and he curses them. He's thrown them out, now he curses them. That you, women, for what you have done, you must now bear children in pain and suffering. Labor, you must labor in childbirth as a punishment for what Eve did. Poor thing. And you man, you must sweat for your bread. No more easy life for you. I'm asking, is that not punishment enough? Still kicked out, now cursed men and women and still we suffering. Everybody's got to sweat for his bread. And every woman has children in pain and suffering, labor. Not enough? No, says the Christian. He said, everybody goes to hell. For what? For the original sin. What Adam and Eve did. God now is going to pursue you. At the beginning of 1986, there will be 4.8 billion people on earth. And everyone goes to hell, says the Christian. Why? Because of what Adam and Eve did. The original sin. You inherited it. It's part of your nature now. And God is going to make you to pay for that. Kicked out of the garden. Sweating for my bread. Woman pay, bearing children in pain and suffering. Not enough. Now he's going to put us all in hell. For what Adam did. I'm asking... Brother, did Adam ask you before eating the apple? Did he? He asked you. Shall I eat the apple? Did he ask you? No. 
my sister there, did he ask you before eating the apple? How can God hold you responsible? Is he a lunatic? This God is he a lunatic? Going to make you responsible for something that you were not consulted about? Does it make sense? Huh? It's a, you know, Major Yeats Brown, in his life of a Bengal Lancer, he says, No heathen tribe has ever conceived so grotesque an idea, such a filthy, dirty idea. No heathen tribe, no, no backward nation, no South Sea Islander or Papuan ever conceived so grotesque an idea involving, as it does, the assumption that man was born with a hereditary stain upon him. This inherited from Adam. And for this stain, for which he was not personally responsible, was to be atoned for. And that the creator of all things had to sacrifice his only begotten son to neutralize this mysterious curse. He said, no heathen tribe has ever conceived such a so nonsensical idea. But the man who lands on the moon, he tells you that. Same guy sitting on his backside here in America is telling the Jews in 73, he said, look, the Arabs are on the move. The Arabs are on the march. They're moving. The guys didn't hit the warning. He said, we know these Arabs, man. Every time they come into battle before that, they shout. So we'll hit you. We'll do this. And we're coming. He said, no, no, no. This is not the Arab way, you know, to work silently, softly. So they were caught off guard, 73. First time in the history of Arab-Israeli conflict, caught off guard because they didn't, didn't heed this, the godfather here. If they'd heeded, Sadat could never have crossed the Barlev line. He could have never done it. He could never have gone into the, uh, the, the Sinai. You see? So I said, this guy here, can he be wrong? The answer is no. So whatever he says must be true. I said, look, my brothers, please, don't allow people to pull wool over your eyes. Think, man, think. See, this is the most nonsensical idea on earth. Adam and Eve sinning, and you're going to go to hell for that. And the way out is that the same God now, he knows there's no way. No way he can change these people. So he must come down to earth. Go into a woman's womb and live there for nine months. Born like any other human child. With all the filth and the muck which made his mother impure for 40 days, says the Bible. Circumcised on the eighth day. Circumcised on the eighth day. Living like any other human. Eating food. Drinking milk from his mother's breast, wetting his napkins, eating food, having a call of nature. And beaten and chased around the almighty God of this universe. He took that role and he died for you at the age of 33. Please, brothers, now, what is this? What is this? Where did you get all these things from? Give us an opportunity. It's about time that the Muslims took it up. That these most nonsensical ideas on earth are getting converts. They're stealing their children in your own countries. You are here. You are God sent here. You. They are thinking that you are sent to them. It's God sent. He's making their mouths water. He's making the Christians' mouth water. You see? He says, these expatriates, these students, you see, now we have stupendous advantages against them, which we never had before. I have to explain this. You see what the Christians are saying? You must know. I'm reading from the Zwemer Institute, the records, what they say. They say that, you see, we have five advantages against the Muslims now, which we never had before. Number one, we can now work from a home base. We live in Tucson with our wife and children, and we can go and catch up these guys one by one. Home base. We don't have to go to foreign lands, thousands of miles away from home base. They can work in, from the comforts of their own homes. They can work. Number one. Number two, so culturally, these guys, you people, are fit to receive the message, culturally. They, in Bangladesh, they have to sit on the floor, on the mat, flies buzzing, and the smoke coming from the, from the kitchen, smarting the eyes. Here, yeah? nice, comfortable, your sofa, chairs, you know, your dining table and your chairs, your air-conditioned homes, everything. Culturally, you are fit to receive the message. They, it's a backward people. They have to go and sit down and reach down to their level. Two. Linguistically, they have to learn the language of the native. If they went to Bangladesh, they must learn Bangladeshi. They go to Pakistan, they must learn Urdu. They come to Africa, in my country, they have to learn Zulu. Wherever they go, they have to learn the language of the native. Now, you have learned the, his language. Made it easy for him to talk to you. Linguistically, he's got one on you now, which he hasn't got in the in the rest of the world, third world, he's got no office. He must learn the language of the native. Previously, if they converted a man, he was a sore thumb, wherever. You see, because in a village, 
One has become a murtad and apostate, and everybody says, you know, I won't use the word, well, how you feel? <laughs> a traitor, a blasphemer, you know? Look at this, that guy there, you know? Did that? You know? What, is, what has happened to him? He's gone mad. Right? But now, he says he can be absorbed. Absorbed in the majority. 240 million Americans. To get 200, one more, sh easy. Two more, thousand more, all can be absorbed. There, you can't be absorbed. You are a sore thumb in your community, wherever you are. Another advantage. Number five, he said, they, the governments are not happy that you're creating a fifth column in their midst. They're not happy. Like Pakistan, you think they're happy? That in Sialkot, there are more than 100,000 Christians. In Sialkot, it's on the border with India. A potential fifth column of over 100,000. Are they happy? They're not happy. But they can do nothing about it. You see, they're not happy. Though they're doing nothing about it, they're not happy. Here, the government is happy. Christianize them and make them one of our own. Let them eat the pig. You know, we can sell more bacon. Let them make them to drink. That we can sell more alcohol. Man, let them enjoy. Let us, let them, let us make them one like us. That they don't start coming smarting us and telling us where we are wrong. Every time the Muslim takes up exceptions, look, this is not right. Your sodomites are not right. Your drunkenness is not right. Your lesbianism is not right. He says, what is all this? These guys are always interfering in our private affairs. He says, now look, let us make them like ourselves. Five advantages they have against us, against you. But at the same time, in reverse, you have all those advantages also against him. God has sent you here. I want to come to settle here. They won't allow me. There are millions and millions of people from the Orient and from Africa, they want to come and live here. No more. Am I right? You can't come and live here. Yes, if, unless you are a professor, a millionaire, or something. Brain drain, they like to keep you. Brain drain. They want to drain our brains. Get them here. But the millions who want to come here, no hope. No hope for them. But you are here. Here is Allah giving you an opportunity to go and deliver the message. To go and do the job. I don't know what excuse you are here for studies, maybe for livelihood, maybe, but this is a God said opportunity for you. You can also work from a home base. You can also speak in his language. You see, all the advantages he's claiming against you, you also have against him. Not to that extent, but you have. I says, go to town, my brothers and sisters, go to town, go and deliver the message of Islam. And Allah is promising you, Sali you a hero who Allah din a kulli. And he's given you a deen that is to master, overcome, and supersede them all. Bulldoze them all. Kulli. This is the destiny of his deen. It's your privilege to go and fulfill his, his promise. Wa'ad Allah haq. And the promise of Allah is true. Yes, the next question. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is not my original question. This is a question from the audience in the back, probably a female, okay? Uh, if, if we're not original sinners, why was Jesus baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist? What's the question again? If, if, if it were not original sinners, why was Jesus baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist? Uh, it looks like a Christian question. Yeah, it is, probably. <laughs> so, if it was not for the original sin, why was Jesus baptized in the Jordan River? That means Jesus had the original sin. He was not born pure. He's not fit. He is not fit to be a sacrifice, if that is the case. If that, you see now, therefore it's an advantage. The brother is a Muslim, he's posing a Christian question. But the, if the Christian posed the question, then I said, look, you say, for the original sin, the person, he or she says, yes. So I said, Jesus had the original sin. That means he's a sinner. He's born also a sinner. He she says, yes. Then he says, it's not fit for the sacrifice, because the Christian says that he was the only one who was sinless. But now, therefore, this is the disadvantage. A Christian question being asked by a Muslim. I don't know how to really deal with it. But this is the best I can do. Yes, my brother. Mr. Didat, may I read three scriptural verses and ask you to comment on them? Yes. I'm reading from the book of Acts, the fourth chapter, the 10th through 12th verse. Be it known unto you all and to all people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doeth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which is set at naught by the builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we, we must be saved.
Uh, I think it's Peter talking. It's supposed to be the words of Peter. No, these. No. Uh, who's, who's uttering these words? Those words were written by Luke. No, no, but now who's? Luke was not talking because Luke was not there. He was not one of the disciples. Peter was so saying these are that. the words of Peter. Yes. That's right. You see, it's the same Peter at the beginning of Acts. At the beginning of Acts, you see, he says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, which you yourself also know. Whatever he did, he says, you, he didn't do it. It was God working through him. He was a man. He says, a man. Peter was the greatest authority as left by Jesus. You remember among the twelve, he tells Peter, he says, Peter, feed my f sheep. Peter, feed my flock. In other words, look after them. Look after them. Say, on this rock, Peter, thou art keepers, and I'll, on this rock I'll build my church. On you, on the strength of what you are talking now, the way you are thinking now, I'll build my church. Peter. So the same Peter is telling you, here in the book of Acts, at the beginning, he says that he is a man approved of God by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did, he didn't do it. So he is the way, no way, no other way. He said, look, the only information Peter had was this man, Jesus. And he's right. He said, look, if they want another way, he was the one who's fulfilling the laws of Moses. He's come to bring them back to the path. They had strayed away from the path. They had gone for the letter of the law. They had forgotten the spirit, the Jews. So Jesus Christ is trying to bring them back. He's trying to elevate them. They're going for the letter of the law, forgetting the spirit. And I can give you dozens of examples. Everything he said was trying to elevate the Jews. So if you want the will and plan of God, here is the man. He is the way. But now your understanding, your understanding is wrong. He is the man. Follow him. What he did, you do. But you don't do that, the Christian. The Christian world doesn't do that. You see, they are now listening to Paul. He said, the law is nailed to the cross. Who, does, who said that? Jesus? No. Jesus. He said, now you're living under grace. You're not bound by the law anymore. Brother Swaggart says, he said, if this, you have already purchased salvation just by believing. And if you want to add more to that, it's not accepted. It's ingratitude on your part. You say, now, look, I must fast, I must pray, I must restrain, I must restrict my life. You say, no, that is not salvation. You are showing ingratitude. The man paid the price for everything. Your rape, your murder, your incest, everything he's paid the price. You just got to accept the penalty that he's paid for. Where did you get it? Where did you get that? Jesus says, he's not of me who does not take his cross and follow me. He says, verily, verily, except you are better than the Jew, no heaven for you. That's what he says, your master. He says the disciple is not greater than the master. He says my father is greater than I. My father is greater than all. He said, the word you hear are not mine. But the father that sent me, he had given me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Even as the father has said unto me, so I speak. Where does he say, I am equal to the Father? He says, my Father is greater than all. My Father is greater than I. Where? No, but Paul. It is Paul. Every time you contradict me, you're contradicting the words of Jesus with Paul, Paul, Paul. Little wonder that Jesus Christ got third position in the book of Heart. Michael H. Hart, the top hundred. He said, look, it's Paul. He's the real founder of Christianity. So, brothers, I said, look, let us go to Jesus Listen to Jesus, because if you listen to Jesus, it is Islam. That is Islam. Whatever he tells you is Islam. Only thing is that he didn't have the opportunity of explaining to you what is implied by you must not even look upon a woman to lust. You didn't know what it really means. So Islam tells you that, you see, it means something more than what you're reading. Not only not looking to lust, because he says, look, I'm looking, admiring God's creation. Look at the shapely form, 36, 24, 36. What a beautiful size, proportion. I'm only admiring his creation. Are you? You're not lusting? We are. We are. Islam says, the Quran says, when you see a woman, cast down your looks. You don't develop that picture. You are developing the picture and getting into a mess. Reason? Because Jesus didn't have time to explain to you. At every step, 
Everything that I show you, I said, look, you the good Christian, you are actually following Muhammad. Though you are giving credit to Christ, the credit comes to Muhammad. You say, don't drink. Brother Swagat says he never touched it. No beer, no alcohol of any kind all his life, he never touched it. I said, look, you are a good Muslim. You're following the teaching of Islam. If you followed your master, he turned water into wine and they had a jolly good time. As the other Christians say, he said, Jesus was no killjoy. He was no killjoy. So you see now, a woman, you come across a lady who has been divorced for no fault of her own. She married her glamour boy, had quarters and children. The guy was a drunkard, an alcoholic. He beat the wife. He couldn't keep a job, starving the children. So she goes before a kindly magistrate. He says, look at this. Look at my condition, what this man is doing to me. I want my freedom. And she gets her freedom, divorce. You come across that lady, unfortunate person, with the liability of three children. You know she's beautiful, still beautiful. She's intelligent. She's been through the mill. She'll make a good wife. Would you not marry her? Are you going to hold it out against her because she made a mistake? Any sensible man says, no, marry her. Give her protection in marriage. I said, when you do that, you're following Muhammad, not Christ. You are a hypocrite if you said you're following Christ. Because Christ said, whosoever marries her that is divorced, committed adultery. That means your children will be illegitimate. And they'll be illegitimate for, according to the Bible, 10th generation. The Bible says in the book of Deuteronomy that the bastard shall not enter the congregation of the Lord even unto the 10th generation. Don't get shocked. This is the King James Version. They say bastard. I didn't say that. It's in the Bible. The bastard shall not enter. That means once you are a bastard, your 10th generations are bastards. That's what the Bible says. So would you like to do that? No. But if you marry that woman and you're going to beget any more children, they're all bastards. And for 10 generations, they'll be bastards. But you say no. No, this woman, how can I hold it out against her? She made a mistake, right? In compassion, love, fairness, justice, you give her protection in marriage. You don't want to, then it happens what's happening. New York has got one million more women than men. They can't get husbands. Your country, 7.8 million more women than men. They can't get husbands. If every man in America gets married, there'll be still 7.8 million women who can't get husbands. In New York, one third of your manpower is gay, sodomites. Your prison population, 98% of your prison population is men. Then mankind, man, gets cold feet for a hundred different reasons. You know, you've got 20 million more women on your hands for whom you have to find husbands. Do you know that? You have no answers. No answers. Salvation, what salvation are you talking about? Talk to them. There's 20 million hungry women. Talk to them. Their salvation. Those one million in, in New York, their salvation. Tell them, sublimate their passions. That's what you're doing. Are you? Sublimating your pensions. Passions. One million women can't get husbands. And the manpower that is around them, one third are gays, sodomites. We would like to entertain the written questions. Please, dear, dear brother, may Allah bless you many times. How should I act with my mother with my, with my mother, uh, you is a follower of Jimmy Stewart. I thought she might have meant she is a follower of Jimmy Stewart. Swagger. Jimmy Stagger. Swagger. Swagger. Uh, your answer is in the Holy Quran, Surah Maryam. You know, we are talking about Surah Maryam, chapter 19 in the Holy Quran. I think it's about verse number 53 or so. Allah tells us about the story of Abraham, Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salam. So, was kurfil kitab Ibrahima, innahu kana siddiqan nabiya. He says, and relate in the book, the Quran, the story of Abraham. He was a man of truth, a prophet. Is qala li abihi, and behold, he said to his father, Ya abati, O oh my father, lima ta'budu ma la yasmahu wa la yubsiru wa la yugni an ka shayha. And on and on. You see how he, Abraham reasons with his father. Surah Maryam, chapter 19, I think it's verse 53 onwards. You read that and you read the commentary in Abdullah Yusuf Ali's translations. He is talking about a dutiful son that Ibrahim alayhi salam was to his father. How he reasons and he loves and how, you know, what, what he does to try to bring father to this light, the light of truth. He's giving us four different conditions of lines of approach. And if you follow that line of approach, inshallah, you'll have all the success. 
all the success. The other thing is, you get this Jimmy Swaggart's books on, on alcohol, you get it on incest, incest, you get it on pornography, you get it on gambling. And you read that and you say, now look, all this what he's trying to teach is Quranic. He's not going far enough. That's the only problem is, he's not going far enough. And the reason is obvious, because the people, he can't take them with him. The bulk of them, they, don't, they can't let go. They can't let go of the things that they are messed in. So he said, now look, show, show, show it to her and say, look, everything that this brother Swagat is talking about is in his condemnation of evil, he is speaking as a Muslim. He has delivered a talk, beautiful talk, on hell is no joke. Hell is no joke. I heard him, and I could see the audience reaction, people tearing. Beautiful. Open the Quran. He said, now look, whatever he's talking, actually as if he has been copying it from the Quran. Open up the subject, hell in the index, 41 different references. Hell, hell. Allah is telling you, hell is no joke. Hell is no joke. It's a serious matter. So you'll be burnt and burnt and burnt, and his skin will be renewed, so he's not finished. Because once you are burnt, the skin becomes insensitive. So no, new skin, and burnt again, and you'll come to the verge of death, and you will not die. You listen to Swagat on his video, and you see, man, he's as if he's copying from the Quran. Unfortunately, we have touched, lost, lost touch with our book. Show to this mother of yours the birth of Jesus in the Quran. Show to her the index, everything that the Quran teaches. And maybe, if Allah wills, you know, she can be inspired, moved to become a Muslim. The question says, regardless of the changes in the Bible, do you suggest that Muslims read the Bible? Isn't there some good to be learned from the Bible as well? There's good in everything. You see, the Bible you don't read for the sake of reading. No Christian does that. No Christian knows the whole Bible. No Christian. I have come across a Christian who knows his Bible. At the moment I say, as much as I know. His book. I haven't come across one yet who knows his Bible better than I know. But generally the Christians don't know. They only specialize on certain verses and phrases. Like, I and my father are one. He that has seen me has seen the father. No man cometh unto the father but by me. And there you are. The whole religion is revolving around that. He doesn't know. He doesn't know. So, reading the Bible would mean that you read it with the idea that how can you approach and draw the other person towards yourself. To say, look, brother, this is very good. I quote it from the book of Ezekiel, which is exactly the teaching of Islam. That what you do, what you sow, you reap. That is Islam. And that sin is not inherited. We see there in the case of Moses. You read there, you know, Moses, when the people, the children of Israel had sinned. They had worshipped the golden calf. So God says, destroy them, kill them. Wipe them out. So Moses goes and pleads with God. He says, oh my Lord, he said, these are my people. You feel for your people. No mind they have done wrong. They are my people. You want to destroy them? He said, look, if you want to destroy them, he says, blot me out of thy book. Forget me. Just throw me out. You don't recognize me anymore. He said, forgive these people. The request is, forgive these people or blot me out of your book. Means forget me. From that respected position of being the anointed one of God, throw me out. Disqualify me. That's his request. Forgive them or blot me out. So God, in answer to that, he says, I will blot him out who has sinned against me. This is his law. Not the innocent. You are an innocent man. Where can I blot you out for what? It's they who have sinned. That is his law. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Not you. Quran says, Allah taziru waziratum wizra ukhra. It says, no bearer of a burden bears the burden of another. What you do, you carry your own sins. The soul that sinneth, it, so you see, it makes it your task easier. Because when he quotes something and you quote, Allah taziru waziratum wizra ukhra, and you start expounding it, he says, no, I don't accept that. He says, look, your book says the very same thing. As I was doing this tonight, he says, God says, I forgive sin for my own sake. If I said the Quran says that Allah is the loving, he says, He will ghafurul wudud, he is of forgiving, he is loving. He is not Shylock, wanting his pound of flesh, but he starts contradicting you. He says, I will visit the sins of the fathers into the third and fourth generation. You say, look, the Bible says, the soul that sinned it shall die, not the sinless.
So it makes your task easier. From that point of view, you get my book, Is the Bible God's Word? And I tell you now how to read, study the Bible. The Christians are not reading the Quran, studying the Quran. I'm talking about the missionaries. They are doing with a prejudiced mind. They are looking for faults, how they can exploit this against the Muslim. Now, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't also learn how we can use his book. And this is Quranic. Allah says, whenever they make a boast, any claim, tell them, Qul hatu burhanakum. He said, produce your evidence, produce your proof. In kuntum sadiqeen, if you are speaking the truth, let's have a look at your proof, your certificate. That sends you to heaven and destines us to hell. Let us have a look. So he produced it, the Bible, in 2,000 different languages. Now, what we are told, see, if Allah commands us to demand proof, it presupposes that when proof is produced, you'll be able to analyze it. And to be able to analyze it, I said, get my book, absolutely free, is the Bible God's word, and study the Bible according to that, so it becomes a weapon of attack and defense. I hope that answers your question. Is, is this the last one? This is definitely going to be the last question, so be here with me, please. The question says, Christians believe in Trinity. Would you please explain the word Trinity, and how would there be one? So if you could explain it in a couple of minutes, we'll sure, appreciate sure. Trinity, you see, this word Trinity is not in the Bible. Imagine, a foundation of faith, the foundation of Christianity, the Trinity, because that's what they're trying to tell us. Is we say, we, God is one, they say, yes, God is one. But he's three in one. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. Believe me, it's not there. They talk about rapture, rapture, something's going to happen towards the end when Jesus comes and everybody will be lifted up, rapture. The word rapture is not in the Bible. They talk about millennium, a thousand years of rule, you know, when Jesus comes. It's not in the Bible. Trinity, not there. Word Bible, Bible is not in the Bible. Believe me, the word Bible is nowhere in the Bible, any Bible. It hasn't got inside, it's on the outside. Who put it there? You put it there. How did you get this word Bible? They got it from the Greek word Biblos. Biblos means book, and they put Bible. Bible means book. Holy Bible means holy book. This word Bible is not in the Bible. Trinity, not there. You see, we have the word Trinity in the Quran. Amazing. The Christian believes he hasn't got it. The Quran has it. The word Trinity is in the Quran. Amazing, isn't it? He believes it. In his book, it doesn't exist. We don't believe it. It's here. You know what it says? Don't say Trinity. Trinity, the word Trinity is there. Salasa, Trinity. Don't say Trinity. Means don't believe in things like that nonsense. In tahu khairal lakum. This is, stop it, it'll be better for you. In namallahu ilahum wahid. For your Allah is one Allah. He's not three in one, he's not one in three. And at the great debate on Monday night, you see, Brother Swagat has used this word Trinity, the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person, that type of thing, that they are all bodies, separate bodies. Father is different, Son is different, Holy Ghost is different, but they are one in a Trinity. I was dealing with that on Monday night. If you get the tape, you'll see it. So I was telling Brother Swagat and the audience, I said, you see, the clearest verse on the Trinity is, the first epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, Jesus, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That is the clearest statement on the Holy Trinity. But I says, you know, it's not in my book. It's not in my Bible. It's not in my Bible. So what do you mean it's not in your Bible? Maybe he thinks I printed it. I said, no, printed by your same church group who printed this, the King James Version. It's in the King James Version. It is in the Roman Catholic Version. It's there. But now it's thrown out by 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations. They produce the Bible called the Revised Standard Version, RSV, which goes to the most ancient manuscripts nearest to Jesus. And in those manuscripts, this verse on the Trinity was not there. This is an interpolation, a fabrication, an adulteration. And as such, Christian scholars of the highest eminence, 32 scholars, 
of the highest eminence backed by 50 cooperating denominations, they threw it out without any ceremony. So that's how good your Trinity is. You got the word Trinity, which is not there in any Bible. Now, that verse itself is now thrown out as a fabrication. Little wonder Allah says, So woe to them who write the book with their own hands. Then they say, this is from Allah. That they may reap from it some small reward, some small benefit. So woe to them for what the hands do right and woe to them for what they earn. But still, the book is very useful. You have to have this knowledge to be able to talk to them. So he says you have to study it. But you study it in conjunction with that little booklet of mine, absolutely free of charge. I sent 10,000 to uh, Baton Rouge for that meeting. There are some still lying there. 10,000 I sent by A. I A lifted them for the meeting. I understand 7,000 were given out. They still have them. There is brother uh, Hamid Ghazali from Lawrence, Kansas, uh, as well as the people, the MSA in, uh, in uh, Baton Rouge. You know, you can get this book from them. You see, in conjunction, study the Bible in conjunction, and inshallah, you'll be able to do a better job than whatever you're doing now. Wa dawana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you very much, Mr. Didet, for this inspiring talk. We really learned a lot if there are some questions that have not been answered, or if there is any question that lingers in anybody's mind, please feel free to contact or to consult the Islamic Center. And there are some brochures there on which you would find, hopefully, the telephone number and the address also. You could consult there. And I'm told that the tape will be given to our Christian brothers, that is the non-Muslim audience, everybody here who is a non-Muslim audience is free to consult the Islamic Center for the tape and it will be given for free. The lecture is being taped in two cassettes, 60 minutes, and it will be given in a TDK cassette free of charge. Just consult the Islamic Center and you will get it. Uh, for uh, for, uh, for the brothers, again, I repeat, we are not here to antagonize anybody. We are not here to belittle any religion, caste, or creed. If you misunderstand us for any reason, please forgive us because this was not my intention. Mr. Didet have not meant anything and will not mean anything, hopefully, inshallah. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact the Islamic Center. Again, for all, for everybody here, and especially the non-Muslim audiences, from the bottom of my heart, from the bottom of the heart of every Muslim, on behalf of all the Muslims, I thank you very much for your patience, for being here, for making this lecture success. وآخر دعوانا الحمد لله رب العالمين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك.